Hey, listen up, everybody. It's Wednesday again, and it's time for Ask Chuck Dixon, number 53. Whoa, been doing this for uh, a while now, six months. Pretty cool. Hey, if you got questions for me and you want to ask them directly, send them to brunobookstore at gmail.com. brunobookstore at gmail.com. You can ask questions anywhere. You can put questions here below the video. Sometimes I miss them, though, especially if you're not watching this video the week it came out. Uh, so, um, and, you know, you can ask me on Facebook or whatever, but brunobookstore at gmail.com is the surest way that I will get and possibly respond to your question here on the Internet. <clears throat> First question, Francisco Bugatti. Hi, Mr. Dixon. I would like to ask, what is your opinion about the Suicide Squad, since the comic appears to share the same premise that the Dirty Dozen, uh, as the Dirty Dozen, I think you mean, which appears to be one of your favorite movies. Yes, it is. Do you prefer the original military concept or the group of villains? And have you ever considered back in the day to write about them? Uh, and sorry for so many questions. If you happen to read John Ostrander's run, which, according to the fan, appears to be the best take on the group, what did you think about it? PD, sorry for my English. I am from Argentina. Well, saludos amigos. My, my Argentinos amigos, I, I love Argentina. I, I've mentioned it quite a few times in this video, I'm sure. And uh, a <clears throat> huge admirer of Argentinian artists. As I've said many and many a time, uh, all my favorite European artists are from Buenos Aires. <laughs> oh, but to answer your question, Suicide Squad. Uh, Suicide Squad, for those of you who don't know, appeared, uh, I, don't know, I, believe, I think it was in Showcase Comics, late 50s, early 60s. Uh, and it was about a, you know, yeah, sort of quasi-military group who investigated strange phenomenon and risked their lives doing it, hence the title Suicide Squad. And uh, yeah, it, was, it, it wasn't it was a really good comic. Uh, it was Bob Kaniger on, on his off days. <clears throat> it was rather wacky as... Um, a lot of DC comics were late 50s, early 60s. Just crazy, crazy stuff. And uh, not a big fan of that run. I've read it. I have a big hardcover collection of it because <clears throat> I'm a geek and I had to read them because I've heard so much about them. But Suicide Squad by John Ostrander uh, in the 80s and I guess into the early 90s, uh, you know, it's considered a comic book classic. And then John was, you know, in his wheelhouse, as they say, on this title this disparate group of ne'er-do-wells, uh, <clears throat> you know, working for a common good. That was kind of, you know, John Ostrander's kind of thing. And I see where you think it might have been in my wheelhouse as well. And yeah, I, 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 I you know, I would have enjoyed writing something like Suicide Squad. And, uh, you know, probably would have taken a different approach to it than John, but I can't say that it would have been better. And it was certainly a fan favorite. It introduced a lot of new characters, uh, resurrected a lot of older characters. And I, I know John was in hog heaven, you know, getting, you know, basically free run of the entire rogues gallery of the DC universe to pick and choose how he wanted to cast his book. And then, you know, um, <clears throat> enhancing the personalities of characters like bronze tiger and, and captain boomerang and stuff like that. Um, and every time he would talk about it, uh, you know, you could just tell, the guy was just having the time of his life. So, yeah, it's a title that might have been fun to write. But as I said, I don't know that I could have done it better than Johnny O. All right. Tim Kretzer. Uh, hi, Chuck. Long time question asked for years by a lot of young folks and not only young ones, of course. What advice would you give to someone wanting to break into the comic book industry as a creator type? Is the question I'd like to toss out, but I'm interested in the light of how much things have changed and seem to keep changing daily in the industry these days. It seems to be more of a minefield now than ever before. The traditional idea of having a main goal would be to eventually work for Marvel or DC doesn't seem to have as much appeal or even make sense financially and career-wise in our times. Well, you're right. Everything has changed. Um, you know, the big two, the big two companies are different now. Uh, they're far more corporate, far more Hollywood, and I mean that in the, the worst possible sense. Uh, and... You know, we're in the midst of this cancel culture thing, which I can't be the only one who is kind of stunned at how much the whole world has changed, like in the past two years. 
where uh, you know some something from a Twitter feed or a message board, you know, a decade ago, can can get you canceled. Of course, you can only be canceled if you participate. Uh, I've probably been canceled a hundred times. I just haven't paid any attention to it. Uh, but you know, at the big two, they, they're part of the cancel culture and have been for a while, even before the cancel culture had a name. So it's tough. That's the minefields you're talking about. Um, and they certainly are a minefield. But the thing is, you can, um, you know, you're a young kid with a dream. You can still work, you know, maybe not at DC or Marvel, but you can certainly still work in comics. You've got all kinds of avenues now. I mean, you just do your own comic, produce it, and put it on one of the social media things or get a website and link to it. I mean, there's a million ways to do it these days. Um, I mean, it used to be yeah, before COVID, you know, you could print your comic and actually sell it at a convention. I know a number of guys uh, who, guys and gals who have, um, you know, published comics and done well. I mean, you got to do the, the yeoman work of going to the convention and sitting at the table and actually hawking the thing. But I do know people that have, um, you know, they've made some decent pocket change uh, and even a living uh, doing that kind of you know, retail comic sales, right, right there to the public, right, creator to the public. And of course, there's always the crowdfunding route, um, <clears throat> which I'm not that good at crowdfunding, but I've had success at crowdfunding because I'm associated with people who are good at it. And, uh, you know, and, and I've done some really interesting projects that I never could have done for even one of the independent publishers. I mean, just wild and crazy stuff. Richard Meyer comes up with the nuttiest ideas imaginable. And the, the stuff's a blast to work on. Uh, and I've done crowdfunders for a number of other people as well. And then, you know, you've got people like Graham Nolan. And, and Graham, uh, he's all crowdfund now and doing very, very well for himself. Um, he's producing, uh, you know, you know high-quality, entertaining comics. And he's delivering them to you on time, you know, in a reasonable fashion for a reasonable amount of money, I think. And, um, you know... So there's a lot of different ways to go, and um, and you just have to learn how to beat the system and, and stick out and, and stick out from the crowd. But it's always been that way. But I think it's even worse now because, you know, there's always gatekeepers, but now we're down, especially if you're dealing on the Internet, you've only got like three or four gatekeepers. And if you get banned by them or canceled by them or you don't give them enough money to promote your product um, because you can't promote the stuff for free. Once upon a time, you could go on a message board and you could reach tens of thousands of people on a message board and you reached all of them because everyone could see your post. Uh, social media isn't that way. They've taken it from a fire hose down to a drinking straw. And uh, even when you post on your own site, you can't. I was complaining to someone today that Facebook is always asking me, you know, give us $40 and we'll reach 2,000 of your friends. Well, I have 5,000 friends. Why does it cost me any money to reach any of them? Why can't I reach all of them with every post? And to use Graham Nolan as an example, not to heap on social media, but damn it, they deserve it uh, because they're treating us raw, these social media companies. But to use Graham Nolan as another example, when his book Chanu came out, um, I didn't know about it for three weeks. You know, the, the campaign was almost over before I started. I even heard of it. Now, Graham and I are back and forth on Facebook nearly every day. So if the Facebook algorithm is so damn accurate, wouldn't it have known that I would want to know about Graham Nolan's new project that he had been posting about every day for three weeks? Why did it take three weeks for me to see that post? It, you know, that's the most vivid example I can think of. You know, one of my best friends in the world had a new comic book project out, and I didn't know about it until the campaign was almost over because of the way social media parses information. And it's our information. I mean, Graham put the post up. Facebook had nothing to do with it. Graham expects it to reach everyone that he expects it to reach, and it doesn't. So basically, social media is a lie and needs to be reformed, needs to be changed. I'd just like to turn the clock back to like 2002 when the Internet was a level playing field. And we all, you know, because all these things that have come up, crowdfunding and all these other things, imagine how they would have worked in 2002. It would have revolutionized how comics were done. If you had a level playing field to promote your own comics on the internet um, in, in the way that we do it now with crowdfunding and Patreon and all that stuff. But I could go on and on, obviously. Dwayne Thomas, 
Two Gun Dwayne Thomas. Well, more than two guns. Uh, I had an interesting email exchange on the topic of where the idea came from that Batman hates guns. I assume it had to be from famously liberal Batman writer, editor Denny O'Neill, probably in the 60s. The truth is that it was obscure Batman writer David V. Reed. Anybody remember him? In 1978. Since then, it has become part of the canon that Batman hates guns. How important do you think Batman hating guns is to the character, and do you think he would ever overcome that? I mean as a part of the fictional character's baseline mental makeup, not will it ever happen in the comics. I think we both know the answer to that. Yeah, if anything, Batman hates comics even more. I, I'm, I'm surprised that Wayne LaPierre hasn't joined the Batman rogues gallery in, in recent years. You know, originally Batman carried a gun, as uber geeks will remind you at any convention you go to. <laughs> it's like one of the little known facts that everybody knows. Uh, yeah, he used to carry a Colt 45 and he used to deal lead to the bad guys. Uh, but that was back in the day. And he lost the gun after a while. But we're always, creators are always playing with the idea of Batman with a gun because the image is so shocking. It's, it's nothing new. Uh, Batman with a gun. Ooh, I want to read that story. I want to find out what's, what's up with that. I mean, I've done it myself. Um, and my take on Batman with a gun is um, that, well, yeah, he's got a thing about guns because his parents were killed by a guy with a gun. My take is, is that he doesn't necessarily hate them uh, because hate is kind of an unreasonable emotion. I mean, you hate and you can't see anything else but the hate. Um, he doesn't like them. He doesn't like the people who use them in crimes. Uh, and he thinks they, you know, are a craven and cowardly lot, you know, because they use a gun. Uh, and, but he respects them because anybody who's been shot at as often as Batman has got to learn to respect guns. When I was writing the character, um, I routinely showed Batman uh, as conversant with firearms. Because if your enemy is going to be using a piece of equipment, you want to know all about it. And I, I wrote a number of scenes where he had, you know, Tim Drake or, and I think once Stephanie Brown, practicing throwing guns, you know, as a weapon. Not shooting them, but, you know, you take a gun off a criminal and you can throw it. Or you can, you know, pistol whip him, bash him in the head with it, you know, Wyatt Earp style. So, uh, <clears throat> And then I also had a story, uh, the, I showed the cover earlier, with, with uh, Gunhawk and Gun Bunny, uh, the, the sniper characters from Batman's Rose Gallery, showing that Batman um, is actually quite the marksman himself. And Denny O'Neill, who you referenced as, you know, an uber-liberal, and Denny O'Neill was an uber-liberal, proud, you know, card-carrying, New York liberal guy, and God bless him for it. Um, <clears throat> he... Uh, He's the one that introduced Henri Ducard, who was a professional assassin who trained young Bruce Wayne. He was one of the people who trained Bruce Wayne to become Batman and showed him how to use a sniper's rifle um, because that was Ducard's weapon of choice. So Batman knows his way around guns. I, I wouldn't say that he actually hates them. Well, by today's criteria, he probably hates them because hate seems to be the emotion that everybody runs to first. You know, this makes me uncomfortable, so I hate it. Uh, but I don't think he hates them. Uh, my Batman, the Batman that lives in my head, <laughs> inside the, the, the vast bat cave in my cerebellum, um, that Batman doesn't hate guns because he's not that little a man. Hope I made that clear. Scott Douglas Redding. My question is from over 20 years ago. I loved your villain, Tad Ryerstad, a.k.a. Nightwing with a hyphen. When he battled his former teacher, Nightwing, are you glad Dick Grayson defeated him so quickly, or do you wish the fight lasted longer today? No, the fight lasted exactly as long, and it was exactly the nature that I wanted it to be. I didn't want Nightwing to be a challenge, Nightwing with a hyphen, to be a challenge for Nightwing without a hyphen in any way imaginable. I wanted it to be a Chuck Norris-style beatdown, that when they finally confronted one another, Dick Grayson just whip the snot out of him. Just, you know, hit him so hard his relatives felt it. And uh, that's really the way I wanted it to be because, you know, Tad Ryerstad was a, um, a hero in his own mind, but a villain in practice. 
um, his actions were villainous. Uh, he was, uh, <clears throat> you know, just an intolerant bully with a, a uh, very grand view of himself. And he justified, be, you know, going violent on people uh, by thinking that, you know, he was emulating uh, Nightwing, the original Nightwing. So yeah, the fight was portrayed. I wouldn't write it any different today. I wanted a beat down. I didn't want to show them as equals in any way. I didn't want you to think that Dick Grayson for even a second was in trouble with this guy. He just swatted him aside. Okay, KP says, have you ever written a straight alien comic that was not a crossover? If so, what was it? If not, what kind of story would you write? Uh, yeah, I did a, a straight up one shot with my buddy Flint Henry uh, called Aliens Pig. And uh, it's that rare alien story that has a little bit of humor in it. Uh, <clears throat> it's about a bunch of hapless guys. It was some sort of, they were blue collar space travelers. I, I can't remember if they were truckers or miners or something. They were along the lines of the crew of the first alien movie, you know, just blue collar, you know, working stiffs. And um, they come upon an alien colony and uh, they have a pig. They have this pig that they've been saving um, for an occasion. Uh, so when it got older, they would they would eat it. You know? So basically, this was a walking ham to them. And uh, in the story, the pig is somewhat of a foil for both them and, <laughs> and the aliens. So, um, you know, I loved writing it. I, I love the Aliens franchise. And uh, I, loved, I loved working with Flint on it because Flint's... Um, Flint can just lean right into that whole H.R. Geiger world. And, uh, you know, his working class stiffs, um, they, they looked believable. They looked real to me. And uh, it's available in the Aliens Omnibus, which I think they keep in print all the time, if I'm not mistaken, or I might be. But it is, uh, it is in the first Aliens Omnibus. But that's the only one I ever did, other than, as you mentioned, I did the crossover uh, Superman Aliens, which was... A blast. KP again. Why is your version a KP twin spin? Why is your version of Frank Castle not a martial artist? You write such great stories featuring martial arts, from Batman to Richard Dragon to Way of the Rat. It makes me wonder why your version of a guy who should be the ultimate badass uses mostly brute force, like a Bud Spencer character. Um, I never thought Punisher should be like. He's not a Superman. He's not even a Batman. Punisher's not an all-rounder. He's a former soldier. And a soldier uh, kills people. You know, he's not a costume crime fighter. He's a killer. He's a soldier. And soldiers kill people. And I don't mean that in a pejorative sense. That's a soldier's job. They go to war and they kill the enemy. And that's how Punisher approaches everything. So the, the finer details of martial arts don't interest him. Uh, you know, he remembers his training from the Marines and he, you know, I can imagine that he would have thought Krav Maga was kind of a, a good thing to know because Krav Maga, Israeli Defense Forces official martial art, is all aimed at killing people. There's nothing about, you know, the Tao or there's no wisdom there or anything else. It's about what's the most expedient way to take a guy down and take a guy out. And that's all the Punisher would be interested in, which makes him more of a brawler than, um, than a martial artist. Because I didn't, I, I didn't see the Punisher. Punisher's kind of a um, down-to-earth character, a more grounded in reality character. And he's, not, he's just not good at everything. Um, when I wrote him, I even said, that, you know, his sniping skills weren't exactly top drawer either. I mean, he was good. He was good with the rifle and everything else, but he wasn't a natural sniper. He had to, he had to work at it. Um, you know, and, you know, yeah, he is, he's an awesome soldier. He's an awesome crime fighter, all the rest of it. But, you know, and I certainly had him in a lot of physical hand-to-hand -hand, uh, confrontations, but, it, you know, I never had, it was never easy for him. I never made it easy for him. And I think that's what I love about the Punisher. And I think when the Punisher's done right, that's the way it's approached, that he's, um, he's expedient, uh, he's a slob hero. Uh, I love all that. And again, these, none of these are pejoratives. That's what I like about the characters. I mean, Humphrey Bogart played a slob hero. Um, and um, but that's the reason. I just, 
I, I thought that martial arts were a step too far for the character. Raph, he asks, what was it like putting together Superman the Odyssey with Graham? I found it in a comic shop a while back and picked it up because I saw you guys as a creative team. Well, thank you. Not to mention, it's not often seen bo you both work on Superman. I enjoyed reading it. Well, um, Superman the Odyssey was really, it was Graham's idea. Uh, Graham had read that book. Oh, God. I can't remember who wrote it. It was a book written in the um, 40s, and it was like a chapter book written for kids. And it was the Superman story. <laughs> And it was slightly different than the comics in emphasis, and every other detail was the same. But in emphasis, it was um, it talked about how Superman was someone gifted with extraordinary abilities, and and then what do you do with those abilities? You know, you have this fabulous talent. Why, what do you focus it on, and how do you use it for yourself or the betterment of mankind or whatever? And Graham became fascinated with well, how would he decide? You know. It's, you you have these abilities, but but where do you go to learn to use them? Who's going to teach Superman how to be Superman? And um, at, you know, just prior to this, D Denny O'Neill wrote those epic stories in Tales of the Dark Knight about the evolution of Bruce Wayne into Batman. These more detailed arcs in which we see, you know, Batman's tutelage. You know, where he went to learn how to be Batman. Um, where he got his ideas, all these different things. And Graham thought it'd be a great idea if we did a project showing that same sort of journey. And and there's a, you know, if you've read it, there's a little nod uh, to Denny's work because uh, there's a scene where Clark Kent is climbing these long stairs to a lamasserie, a, a, a monastery up in the Himalayas, and he meets a guy coming down the other way, and it's, it's Bruce Wayne. Bruce Wayne has finished uh, <laughs> learning all he can from the Tibetan monks and Superman is on his way to see what he can learn. And uh, much of the story takes place, our story takes place in that thing. So yeah, it was driven by Graham. I don't know why, if you, if you notice it, Graham's name is listed first and we co-plotted it. I don't know why Graham didn't write it all on his own, but I'm glad he invited me to help him with it. Uh, I think he wanted someone to, you know, bounce ideas off of. And I, if I remember correctly, and Graham can correct me if he wishes, uh, I think I actually flew to Buffalo uh, and stayed in Buffalo for a few days with Graham while we hashed this one out. Now that I'm talking about it, yeah, I, that's, I remember going to Buffalo and spending a few days just talking story, and, and this is the story we talked about. Because the two of us, like, we did our best work if we were in each other's proximity. We were actually in the room, you know, you know challenging each other. Uh, to, to greater heights or whatever, or, you know, just working it out in person. You just couldn't do it over the phone. It just didn't have that same zing. So, um, yeah, it was a grand deal. And it's, I think it's the only time I worked with Mike Carlin as an editor. And, and that's thanks to Graham because Graham went in and pitched it to him and then, you know, suggested that, uh, that he co-write it with me. But it was a lot of fun. And I, I liked writing Superman. I, I wish I could write more. R.B. Probst. A few questions for a future ACD. How was the experience of writing Rush City for DC, the miniseries written in conjunction with Pontiac featuring their Solstice sports car? Did GM have any say or so in the scripts? Were there plans for more than one miniseries? Was Rush a character you would have liked to use in your other series but wasn't allowed to due to issues with GM? Was just giving him a nondescript makeup car discussed so he could be more fully integrated into the DCU? Uh, yeah, Rush City was an odd project. It was proposed by Pontiac to promote, as you said, they're, they're the Pontiac Solstice, and a particular model of Solstice. And it was proposed by somebody at Pontiac to DC, uh, and it was done as a special project. And, uh, but it would be um, distributed like a regular comic book, but also it would have an enhanced print run because they printed, you know, tens of thousands of extra copies that were uh, either sold or given away at Pontiac dealerships. I imagine given away. Uh, who goes to a comic book? Who goes to a car dealership and expects to pay for a comic book? Um, and it was it, it was fun to write. And boy, I can't remember who the editor on it was, but there was no interference from anybody. I never much heard from the editor 
and I never heard from Pontiac uh, beyond um, them sending me. Um, they have a monthly Pontiac magazine, which included an article about the comic. I didn't quite understand why they just didn't print a few pages from the comic in the magazine. It was a magazine after all, but hey, what do I know? Um, and initially going into it, my, my only question was, can I use characters from the DCU? Does this occur in the DCU? So, you know, I was able to use um, uh, Black Canary in a couple of issues. Seemed like a good fit. Uh, and uh, I also used uh, a character created by Graham Nolan and I, Gearhead, because uh, it seemed like a natural fit. Gearhead is basically a self-transformable cyborg human being. And I thought, well, what if our, our um, lead character is up against this, you know, supercar, turns out to be half man. And that was a lot of fun to write. And, um, yeah, it was fun. It was like spy, intrigue, crime, transporter kind of stories. And it was pretty cool. I, I, don't, I, don't, know how many, I don't know how many cars they sold. I think that the comic did all right, but it didn't warrant any further um, continuation within the DCU. And I don't know if the lead character is unencumbered or if, you know, Pontiac has to get asked permission or whatever. My personal theory as to why this all happened was that there must have been somebody on the board at Pontiac who was a comics fan <laughs> and just wanted to do something with comic books. That's that's what often happens when industry meets comics. Uh, you know, when somebody in a pharmaceutical company wants to, you know, hang out at DC Comics, they suggest doing a book about, uh, you know, Batman promoting Ambien or something. So there you go. There's your answer. Um, let's see what we got next here. Mark Charters. And I'm writing to ask whether you are a fan of some of the older science fiction writers, people like A.E. Van Valk, uh, E.E. E. Doc Smith, Clark Ashton Smith, H.P. Lovecraft, and the like. I don't generally go that far back. Uh, that's like 30s and 40s stuff. I've read all of Lovecraft stuff. The others I've read a little bit here and there. Um, my introduction to science fiction paperbacks, I mean, I was reading Burroughs, I get Rice Burroughs, but uh, my, my big submersion into science fiction was, I guess I was about uh, 12, and um, a, my family had become friends with family who owned a local restaurant, and, and you know, the family would go there to eat and sometimes just hang out for the evening, and... Um, the, their oldest son was like four years older than me, but he liked science fiction, he liked comics, and so, so he and I would talk and everything else. So eventually, I think, I think they moved to Florida. They sold the restaurant and relocated to Florida. And um, my dad and I went over and helped them move. You know, that, that's that kind of friendship it was. And I remember their oldest son, his name was Buzz. Who could forget a name like that? Uh, <laughs> no wonder he was in the science fiction. Um, he said, we're moving. There's stuff we got to leave behind because there's no room on the truck. And he says, I want you to have this. And it was this huge box filled with science fiction paperbacks. And because he was four years older than me, you know, a lot of them were from like the late 50s. And so I got introduced to all these great writers that I'd never heard of before. And, you know, it was a box of free books. Of course, I was going to read every single one of them. You know, and I ended up doing that. I mean, you know, Guys like Frederick Paul and, um, you know, like you see here, Algis Budrys, um, Philip K. Dick, you know, you know, I got to read all these guys. And I, I spent like a whole summer just reading that box. I mean, went down to the shore. I took some, I took a handful of books with me. There was always a book lying by my bed. Everywhere I went, I had one of these books and I just totally immersed in them, you know. And like I said, a lot of the guys I got interested in were basically 50s writers, you know, H. Beam Piper and Simak and Norm, Norman Spinrad, guys like, you know, you see here. And, um, you know, but some of them I got, you know, more and more involved with. I just fell in love with the writing of Frederick Brown. Uh, he, he wrote the shortest short stories ever. I mean, just brilliant. The guy was all about plotting. Uh, the, the man was obsessed with plotting. He, he never buried a story or hacked something out and just buried it under you know, quirky dialogue and interesting characters. He always had everything there. These were all the, 
you know, all the goodies in one story. And, um, and later in life, I discovered his crime novels, which were equally good and equally well plotted. Arthur C. Clarke is another guy I moved on to after a while. Success of the movie 2001, everybody became aware of Clarke. And uh, I had to read everything. I, I read everything the guy wrote like over another summer, maybe three years later. So, yeah, I mean, um, I was into the older science fiction writers. Science fiction kind of lost me in the 70s when, uh, you know, as early as the 70s, it began to be about the author's personal sexual proclivities, which, you know, it was like, you know, it seemed like every science fiction novel I was reading was an extended Dear Penthouse forum letter. And I was just lost interest. You know, there wasn't any stories. There wasn't any sense of wonder. wasn't any interesting characters. They were just dry ball dealing with issues and concepts. And it's, it didn't fascinate me anymore. Uh, to this day, I want action in my science fiction. I like action stories. I want something to happen. And um, I'll still go back every once in a while and read a, a, a Simak or a Cornbluth novel. And, um, and I listen to, I can't tell you how many times I've listened to X, X minus one, the radio show. I, I know some of those episodes by heart. So there you go. Another question about my reading taste. Chris W. with the challenging question, Joseph Lombard versus Elmore Leonard. Who you got? That's a tough one. That's like asking me to choose between my children. I mean, you got Elmore Leonard. Elmore Leonard, man, the guy's like a legend. The guy wrote to the day he died. I mean, he wrote Westerns. He wrote great Westerns. When Westerns didn't sell anymore, he switched over to crime fiction. And he was equally successful at both. He equally wrote with tons of authority. And, of course, his his dialogue is legendary. I mean, here's a guy, uh, one of the few writers I like, to, to whom plot really isn't all that important. There's a plot, but it's not really all that important. And, and and he doesn't make the plot important. He kind of buries the plot under like a character's journey. And and a lot of times writers will use that as a lazy way of writing. But but somehow invisibly, he's a visible hand writer, behind the scenes, the story keeps moving along, keeps chugging along, keeps holding your interest, even though it doesn't he's not bringing the plot to the forefront. Uh, and of course, as I said, the dialogue. Uh, the letter dialogue just cruises along. You can hear it in your head as you're reading it. And um, he comes up with some indelible characters. And the thing I like about an Elmore Leonard story is he manages to make it sus- suspenseful and challenging and often edgy, but you always know things are going to work out in the end. You always know that his character is going to come out on top or at least escape the worst consequences of what could happen to him. You're never going to have a downer ending in an Elmore Leonard novel. And you're never going to have cheap things like children in jeopardy or abused women or things. You just didn't deal in that stuff because it's kind of low hanging fruit to get a reader's sympathy. So you would deal with, you know, um, you know, flawed lead characters who were, but they were, they were cool. They were calm. They were collected and whatever, area of expertise they had they were really good at it and um and in the end they always won out because i remember we were watching the series justified and we were getting toward the end of the last season you know a lot of the end of last season on a lot of these shows they end in downers everything goes wrong or something horrible happens and my wife was watching it with me was actually concerned i'm really worried this is going to happen i'm really worried that i said don't worry it's an elmore leonard story everything's going to work out and she said, well, how can you watch the show and knowing that just everything's going to work out? I said, because the guy's writing so damn good. And I know I know Elmore Leonard didn't write all of Justify. He didn't write every episode. He only wrote one. But but Justify was so closely written in the Elmore Leonard style. It adhered very faithfully to, to the Leonard way of telling a story. And um, I just knew everything was going to work out, and it did. Every every Everybody did that got what was coming to him, got what was coming to him, and everybody who remained true and loyal and brave uh, came out winners in the end. Now, Joseph Wambaugh, like I said, I can't choose. Another huge favorite of mine. I discovered Wambaugh before I discovered Leonard, mostly because uh, Wambaugh, um, you know, his first novel, New Centurions, 
uh, got a huge PR push from its company. Wamba was all over television. Eventually, Wamba had his own television show, Police Story. And I read every single one of his novels as they came out. I just, I just, I just dig this guy's writing. And one of the reasons, well, he's a very talented writer. He's a very talented writer. He's got a great ear, like Leonard, for dialogue. Awesome ear for dialogue. Um, there's the, he wrote one of my favorite lines of dialogue everywhere, anywhere, but I won't repeat it here because it's not safe for work and I'm a gentleman, but it's, it's, it's one of the funniest lines of dialogue I have ever read. And um, it's in the choir boys if you want to hunt for it. But, um, <clears throat> but in addition to being a great writer with a great ear, he was also a cop. Uh, he, he, had, he had been a uniform cop in L.A., and uh, he had a career as a cop um, um, detective in the burglary division. So, you know, he met a lot of characters. He met a lot of cops. He heard a lot of cop stories. And he brings them to us in these novels. And I just think they're brilliant. The Choir Boys is a, it's like the catch-22 of, of police novels. It's an awesome ensemble cast with, you know, a dozen stories running parallel to each other. Uh, some are hysterically funny. Some are disturbing. There's a scene in Choir Boys you just you just simply can't forget after you've read it. And, and stories like The Black Marble, uh, which is one of the most downer novels and downer movies you'll ever see in your life, but but brilliant and and also funny. It's got a, a one of it has an extended comedy sequence. Uh, I think that only uh, maybe somebody like P.G. Woodhouse. Uh, could have surpassed uh, about a, a guy trying to get away from the cops through a dog kennel. And he just keeps climbing from one kennel cage to the other, meeting one meaner dog than the last as he goes along. Um, it's it's freaking brilliant and, and brings tears to your eyes. It's so funny. Uh, and, it, you know, in recent years, he's written these Hollywood novels, Hollywood Moon, Hollywood Station, other ones like that, that are very good police procedural mysteries but they're also character studies um you know a guy knows what he's talking about he knows cops he was a cop for for a long time and just a just a whip smart guy with a great ear and a tremendous talent now the thing that wamba has over elmore leonard is that he writes books of reportage he writes non-fiction books about crime and punishment in america and they're classic uh, the Onion Field is right up there with In Cold Blood as an American true crime classic. The Onion Field is a thick book, but it's a page turner. And it's a brilliant study of a pair of real scumbag sociopaths who kidnap, literally kidnap, a pair of L.A. PD officers. Um, and it goes into that incident, what led up to it. The, the, the four men and their lives and, and how their past lives impacted on that night when they were abducted at gunpoint. And then the trial. Well, so much of the book is the trial. It is the longest running trial in the history of California. And it is one of the most frustrating reads you will ever read. I mean, it is just, it, it taught me more about what's wrong with the American legal system than anything else I'd ever read. Because Wombaugh goes into painstaking detail, and he never tells you what to think. Now, here's a cop, and you know what he thinks through the novel, because he's a cop. Uh, he's true to the blue. But um, he, he leaves it up to you. He, he sets it up so that you, you find your own outrage here. He just presents the facts, and you find your own outrage. Uh, he did another book called Lines and Shadows about illegal immigration, all of which has come true today. Uh, and that book informed me enormously about the situation of the border, even though it was written in the 80s. Uh, it's it's still true today. It's still relevant today. And his other crime book, which is probably my favorite, I love The Onion Field, but Echoes in the Darkness, uh, I love even more because um, it's a daring piece of journalism. Echoes in the Darkness is about the disappearance and probable murder of Susan Reiner, a uh, high school teacher, who taught at a school not very far from where I lived uh, in, in uh, Lower Marion Township, Pennsylvania, uh, a disappearance of her and her children uh, and how it ties into a con man and Satan worship and all kinds of things. There's a vast, weird criminal conspiracy that was going on at this high school 
uh, with the teachers and the principal. The principal, just to give you an example, the principal of this high school, his nickname at the high school was the Prince of Darkness uh, because um, he was creepy. He would go into his office and never come out. And his office had no windows. Uh, he's like, his office was like a basement and he would never come out. And uh, you would rarely see him around the school. But the creepiest thing about the guy was, is that uh, he had committed an armed robbery <laughs> of an armored car by himself and killed a, uh, a Brinks guard. And this didn't come out until the Reinhardt murder investigation led to him. So there's a number of crimes going on all in this high school, this little suburban high school. And it's a fascinating story about uh, everything. And the most daring thing about it, why I say it's daring journalism is there's a lot of really funny scenes in it. Now it's a dreadful story about, you know, a woman and her children being killed and possibly theoretically they have seems to believe so killed. And then their bodies dissolved in a vat of acid. Yeah. The Prince of darkness had a vat of acid in his basement. You see what I mean about this guy? So um, yeah, it, 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 it but he, but he manages to put in some humor. There's some funny, funny stuff in the book, you know, gallows humor. And uh, not around the murder or anything else, but around, and, and his, cho his choice of wording and, and everything else is, um, the guy can end a chapter. Nobody ends a chapter the way Joseph Wambaugh does. He always, you know, that inspires me. I always try to think, well, how would Wambaugh, where would he end this chapter? And what, what kind of line would he have at the end of this chapter to make you go, holy crap, you know, uh, so yeah, I'm, Leonard versus Wamba, clearly Wamba wins by a nose with me. I respect both guys enormously and they've had an enormous impact on my own prose writing, but yeah, I got to go with Wamba, you know, just, just gut, got to go with them. So that's it for this week. Uh, I hope you enjoyed it. Thanks for listening. Thanks for watching. Thanks for listening and watching and, um, hit that like button. It helps me. Share with your friends. You people have been great about sharing and, and getting my subscription numbers up. And it's created a, a geometrical projection in the number of views I get. But I need more. I need more. I need that geometric project progression to keep going. You know, tell a friend who tells a friend who tells a friend. So I can keep doing this because I want to keep doing it because I, I enjoy it. You enjoy it. I enjoy it. See you next Wednesday. See you down the road.